All right, we're super happy to be joined by our longtime client, Ian Landsman, CEO and founder of HelpSpot. Um, and we're going to be talking to him for a while today about the growth of HelpSpot. It is a help desk software that um, started way before a lot of the other help desk softwares. Um, and I'm not going to steal Ian's thunder, nor do I really know the history. But was Ian, it, thanks. Was it in the 90s? I remember it being no, so, like super far, early. Okay. 2005, <laughs> early 2000. 2005, okay. it came out, kind of started it in 2004. Yeah. So let's, let's start there, Ian, and then we'll move into kind of transitioning your story all the way to working with us. Um, but super cool kind of founding and I believe family kept the business in the family um, story while you and your wife have a family and are raising kids. Um, and interesting stuff about navigating HealthSpot through the introduction of a lot of huge, extremely well-funded VC backed startups that are direct competitors while you stayed bootstrapped this whole time. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'm super excited to get in. Let's start at the founding story. How, how I don't think I've ever asked you this. How did it start? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, 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 I'll go all the way back to the very, the impetus, which to was the nineties. Benji wants you to go back to the nineties. This is, um, it's just after the nineties. It's probably like 2001 or something like that. I started at, um, I was the assistant director of academic technology and e-learning, which is a long title at a college in my town here. And, uh, this college has this, uh, basically a big deal with IBM. So everything has to be IBM. Like, especially back then there was like, you can't even have a Mac on campus, like IBM only whatever, fine. So everything has wow. to also be on a mainframe, like wow. has to be on an IBM mainframe. So see, I knew we were going back to the nineties, right? Yeah. We're, 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 we're going back to the seventies, like, yeah. but, um, so anyway, so the school, uh, their help desk was a mainframe terminal application. And so like, you couldn't copy paste, you couldn't send an email. Like you literally couldn't do anything, but you had like three lines where you could like write the issue up and that's all you had. And like some check boxes or whatever. And I was like, this is freaking insane that I have to use this thing. And like, you know, by 2001 to like, we have like the modern ish internet, right? Where like things are in browsers and there's email and there's copy paste and whatever. So wait, so you're working at the like office that's managing the mainframe. So you're getting support requests or sort whatever. Of. Like, I'm working actually in the, this e-learning office, but oh, I just okay. have to use the help desk tool. But I as see. I'm uh, using it, it's infuriating because it's a terminal window and it can't do anything that you could do in a browser. And so I was like, well, you know, if this big organization, I mean, this is a pretty good sized college, thousands and thousands of employees, like this is their solution. I'm like, there has to be all these other organizations out there that are using these insane solutions. And like, maybe we could do something browser based that's more modern. It's not like client server and stuff like that. So that was kind of the impetus. I started chipping away at it. It took me like a year or so to build it, maybe a little bit less. Um, did, did you already develop software at this point or did you? Yeah, so that's an interesting part. Like I had been doing some software development um, at a previous job. Uh, I was in like a startup sort of thing, but I didn't know any programming when I started there. So I learned the program there, um, but I still wasn't an expert. And some things were like new, like JavaScript was like kind of a newish thing and in, in terms of using it for like the interactivity we all think about today and stuff like that. So I'm literally coding help spot at one point. Like I have the JavaScript Bible open on my lap, which was like a big <laughs> book this thick. And because that's how you learn stuff in the early two thousands. And like, I'm like coding help spot, learning JavaScript as I do it. So, uh, which actually does factor into some of the stuff we'll probably talk about later, but so at one point it's like, okay, am I going to really do this? I quit my job. My wife kept her good job she had so kind of bankrolled us that was like our vc was my wife basically like you know just continuing to work i quit did, did the university you worked at become a client of the software at this point or you just no quit? they never oh. became a client no no because oh wow yeah yeah what, it was what just made you take the leap at this point then because it was just like i wasn't that good a programmer yet and it was like if we're gonna and you know you have to remember too back then there was no tools like there was no frameworks there was no yeah. nothing so every single <laughs> thing we did had to be done from scratch like i was literally coding i don't even know like a half a million lines of code or something like that to like just to build the first version i mean right now today i could build what was the first version 
in like three weeks because like 90 percent of it is just out of the box i already have it yeah you know, it's like yeah. i had to build all that stuff back then um you couldn't put one line of some ruby on rails code that right, right. for you all it's all time. just works magically yeah. you have email integration and <laughs> authentication and everything's just like there instantly yeah right no we had none of that right so um so i'd like either like basically invent or reinvent or you know scour the internet for how to do stuff um, that I didn't know how to do. Um, so, so, yeah. Side note that I just think yeah. would be funny for the listeners. Benji and I one time got scammed out of $3,000 with some Upwork international developers <laughs> because right. we were trying to create some, like, some It was a job app. board. Yeah, a job board. A job That's board. what it was. A job board. And um, these guys were like, yeah, we can do it. And I was like, okay, we're not developers, so we don't know head from tails, right? right? And the person would start, we like hired them and I like had it at 15 hours and she kept she, the profile was she, I don't think it was a she in the end, right. <laughs> um, emailing or Upwork messaging saying, can you just give me max hours? Can I just work full time? I was like, sure, it'll go faster, right? right? And like months later, I was like, and then Upwork takes screenshots. It would be screenshots and we're not programmers, but I've dabbled a little bit. Screenshots of just weird code-like things, but it didn't actually look like real code. And I was like, that's weird. Maybe I just don't know. And right. I, like, I think a month went by, we spent three grand and we were like, okay, what do you have so far? And it was like the ability to like create a user account and that's it or something it like was, that. It was so <laughs> difficult to do. It was like, it was unusable. Yeah, and I think like Classic. a month later or something like that, I found I some open found... source job board that, <laughs> that was like out of the box. And I was like, why did yeah, we spend yeah. so much time doing this? Right. Turns out there are WordPress themes for like 60 bucks <laughs> course, that are yeah. just like WordPress job board, the, like fully designed. Yeah, now there's and everything, like, right? It's just out there. The only benefit of that is that I eventually found this. It was in like Laravel PHP framework. Mm -hmm. I found um, a, a guy that is just amazing and and now actually has moved on to a full-time job, Chris Landon, but we still work with him. And he was, like, at that time, like, a, a kid, like, a, out of high school, college in Southern California. And he looked at it and he was like, this is completely useless. And he was like, <laughs> who did you hire to do this? And I was like, wait, what yeah, happened? Like, if we were to camp? use it, we need to rebuild it from the ground and up. And he was like, like, I could give you in laravel there is a single line that sets up the ability to create user accounts like sets right. up a mini app in a single <laughs> exactly. line like five seconds tabish and i was like oh my god we got scammed <laughs> oh man i so wish i had laravel because we're actually uh, two anecdotes on my end to that story is like one we actually run a very successful job board around laravel and then the other thing is that we're big huge and kind of laravel i run the online conference and all this stuff so oh, cool. like to have had laravel back then I mean, I could like cry right now just thinking about like the like pain I went through and like everything Laravel gives you now, just like out of the box. It's just like, wait. So, oh, Help oh, Spot is written in Laravel. Well, partially, it's been okay. put onto Laravel, but there's still a lot of legacy stuff from like 17 years ago. Um, we're actually just in the early process of totally rebuilding Help Spot, literally, kind of from the ground up. But oh, cool. Early days on that. That'll be like fully take advantage of every little piece of laravel that there is um, oh what a coincidence that that's uh, where we got scammed out of two thousand dollars okay i yeah. Wait, yeah, I, I was gonna say i don't want to hijack the story i want to go all the way I back to the story. Sorry. Your, your wife your wife funding help spot yeah so she uh kept her job and like you know when we hadn't set up our whole life around this idea so it was a little tight obviously because it's like whatever we had i sold my car so i just was like kind of stuck home all day because we were oh, out wow. in like, the suburbs um that was kind of like a, the other the sort of startup money the actual like money money was just like selling the car so cut that expense made some money on that put that in the bank and uh yeah and that was kind of like the the beginning there and that was like so 2005 is before SaaS really like i think base camp comes out maybe that came out like 2004 but it was like super wild and new it was way before zendesk and help scout and all the big kind of modern SaaS. Oh, I didn't apps. realize that. So 2004, 2005, the idea of software being this online web app where you pay monthly instead of going to Best Buy or Fry's Electronics and getting the box right. and paying a one-time price, that was still new then. 
Yeah, still new. Like, well, especially at this scale, like it, it was new that the idea that everything had become affordable enough that, you know, a couple people or one person could start a software business. Um, and it was still so new and I was so kind of green to it that this is where it relates back a little bit to me, like learning to code while I did this essentially was like, I, HelpSot wasn't SaaS really um, until about six or seven years ago. Like you had to download it and install it on your own web server. Uh, so it was still uh, running the browser, but you had to have an IT department. You had to install yeah. it. And then it was a web application, but it wasn't centralized where we would run it for you. So uh, and it was yeah, a one-time so cost. It was one-time cost, yep, like owned license. And then there was essentially recurring revenue in that like every year you paid for support, but it was optional. Like the software mm -hmm. still worked if you stopped paying for support. Um, sure. Whereas like now we sell on subscription. So, you know, if you stop paying, it stops running at all. But back then, uh, yeah, it would still run. Um, and it's kind of crazy because we still have customers today who like stop paying for support, you know, in 2014, but then they just show up like literally, you know, yesterday and they're like, okay, I'm ready to like upgrade. And so we have to like bring them through that whole process of like getting on a modern plan and renewing their support and whatever. All It's, it's kind of crazy. We deal with a lot of stuff that like your, your modern SaaS apps don't deal with that have only ever charged monthly and only take credit cards. That's a very different world from what I live in, um, where we have invoices and purchase orders and we still people who have owned licenses, we didn't force them to move to subscription. So we still have people paying annual support. That's not a subscription. Oh, wow. um, yeah, we don't sell those licenses anymore. So you can't buy a new installation that way. And anybody buying today new is on a subscription, but, uh, but you know, we left all the other people as legacy accounts. So yeah. So we're at 2005. Wild. Yeah. And is it still just barely making any money your wife's supporting it yeah so, well so when we wife was supporting it until like october 2005 when we released and then um we had just built up a, a tiny list i mean it's sort of insane now i mean there was literally like maybe 50 people on this list um to email when we launched and we got some sales from that right away and we I had like, the 50 people. yeah I was, I was gonna ask so thing. mostly that was from um i was like a big participant in like the business of software forums. I don't know if you've ever heard of those. They were like Joel Spolsky he had this forum for bootstrappers basically. And so it kind of was like people on there or people on there took it to their companies and put in the word that might want to get on this new thing and ditch their old crusty thing, or if they're just using email. And so that was like the impetus. We also had like, I don't know if this was from the very beginning though. We had a little SEO play. I don't know if it was literally before we launched, but it was very early called open source help desk list.com, which I believe is still out there, <laughs> which is um, just a listing of all the open source help desk lists. And then like with an ad or open source help desk apps with like our ad at the top, like, you know, help spot, blah, blah, blah. Oh, um, you know, not dissimilar from a like hey, 2000, top yeah. 10. Uh, yeah, it was the know, time best to do help SEO. Desk that yeah. was the time to do SEO back then. You just put stuff the keyword, like 400 of them as much yep. as possible. Yeah. I didn't do too much of the straight keyword stuffing, although like the open source help desk list obviously inherently has, you know, help desk right. has <laughs> a lot of the elements in there. But um, no, that was like the golden era of SEO. I mean, we were, because <laughs> I was very SEO focused from the beginning because I was like, I, I have no money. Like I can't, even back then Google ads were too much. And I didn't really have anything else. Like I didn't cold calling wasn't something I was going to even consider or anything like that. So like literally I had Google and SEO as my play for marketing. <laughs> and so like, you know, so I was learned up a little bit on SEO already got a little farther along on that optimized the website, you know, decently. And we were like on the first page for a long time for years with like no real work other than, you know, optimize the website and has a few good inbound links from, you know, people I knew who were bootstrapping also and stuff like that. But and this first, is the first, first page for, for help desk software. Yeah, yeah. for help wow. desk software. Yeah. Um, and 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 was that it? Like that was, that was it. the keyword keyword strategy was one keyword. One keyword. I mean, we had some like <laughs> I love. There was probably a few <laughs> others, but it was essentially one keyword. Uh, in, you know, realistically, and um, and what yeah, was that bringing in? Could you just tell that when you were on there, you're like, oh, people just keep coming. 
Oh yeah, I mean we ne- we still have never had more sales than back then, but it was sort of a wow. It was different time. Like we were charging way less. I mean our revenues are much higher now. Like you know it was less money we were charging, but also it was like this golden era of like everybody was moving off client server or people who were just using email were like we need there's software to do this now. Why don't we have the software to do it? Yeah. So you had this big surge of like literally every company in the world being like we need help desk software, and so you know we kind of like had a big uptick with all that <laughs> and then uh you know sometimes you just catch that right it's like yeah i can't repeat that where like yeah the internet comes to bloom and everybody wants help that software right so that's yeah. not really realistic um so quantity wise like just in terms of like new users those were like the peak years just because there was a lot of new users but um yeah and then like 2008 2009 you start to get like zendesk and those guys come in um, who are like funded, who are a pure SaaS. Um, oh, at that you know, time you were still selling stuff. the one-time licenses. Yeah, we didn't switch to us offering our own SaaS until like 2015, probably. Now we end up doing like this stopgap because obviously it's like okay, well, like Zendesk and these other ones are coming out and like, obviously people are moving towards like, yeah, I just want to sign up and I don't want to have to like go to it for things and all that stuff. So we ended up partnering with like a hosting company that I, I knew the owner of and they were basically like sassifying help spot on our behalf. So like, if you want hosting, you would go to them, they would do it all. You didn't have to go to it, but it wasn't seamless like a modern SaaS at all. Um, it was just like, it was still like a multi-step process of you had to go, you were paying them a separate amount of money from what you were paying us. Um, so it was like a separate relationship, but at least you didn't have to have IT involved. Be- beyond the business model changing, how, how did things change for your business during that time period? So 2009 to let's say 2015 as all these new players enter the market. Yeah, so, like, that was kind of, so we had that, like, the earlier run where, like, everybody's moving to help desk software, and there was just less competition and all that stuff, and then you had, like, tons of competition. Like, then, like, 2008, 9, 10 is, like, everybody, all the tools are there. Everybody can start a help desk app or, obviously, all the other types of apps that we all have now, like, instantly, basically. Um, so, yeah, so that it definitely came down off those highs. Um, and then, like, after that, I would say, like, around... 2012 something like that 2013 it kind of just leveled out and we've been like mostly level like since that point um and there's like i think a lot of different reasons i mean part of it is just like way like literally a thousand times more competition probably right like not (laughs) exaggerating um and then even things like you know like that's a we had our three children they're getting bigger in that phase, but they're still like, you know, some of them are babies and some of them are six. And so like, obviously like I'm not doing all the hours and losing some focus on the business just in terms of the hyper focus I had before that. So, and I was like, but we were making enough money. So I didn't really have the desire to like really push extra hard there. Um, we did hire employees in there and things like that too. So it wasn't just like me running the yeah i was gonna day. ask what the size of the team was around this time and yeah so we what had year a, we're at now but like in 2008 or 9 we had our first employee which is like a you know customer service person um just to take off that kind of yeah day to day you know get get caught up in a help desk issue for four hours with somebody and obviously then your day is kind of shot so um hired that person first Then we hired some developers, but the team size, you know, now the team size is five people. Um, So we've been small the whole time. Um, Mm -hmm. It was a little smaller back then. Most of the time was like, you know, three to four, but. um, At any point in the story, does your wife quit her job and. Oh yeah. Yeah. She quit pretty early. Like once we started selling, we were making enough money to, that she didn't have to work. So she, um, we had our first child she left her job like at that point and um actually she was trying to work from home and keep her job but it was like kind of before work from home obviously and they were like "Ah." (laughs) even though they had they kind of had the tools for it in this company it was a big four big five then accounting firm but uh they were like nah you can't like permanently work from home and we lived like an hour and a half away and whatever so anyway so she yeah she left her job there she did work in the business for a couple years 
um mostly like at the very beginning she was like all kinds of stuff like she would help with support and testing and uh, documentation and things like that and then later on she was like kind of the business operations person with like books and payroll and all that stuff um and then yeah i think after our third kid we were like all right just it's just too <laughs> chaotic so she just went to mostly um take care of that crew and then we had like we have like a a bookkeeper who's a contractor and things like that. We have some, some people like that around this whole time. Like it, it sounds like at some point when it was doing well and, and she could quit her job and you guys were making good money. I know that when we, when you, when we, you first hired us grow and convert, you said something like, you know, I never have really invested in marketing until now. Right. Walk me through just kind of the, like, lifestyle or philosophical decision there like it, it, a, a lot of because it's not I, I don't know if i'm just reading a bunch of like startup bro stuff and listening right. to those podcasts and running in those circles but it, it with that mindset that's very not normal is it's right. very like and i'm also in like san francisco bay area it's like if you get any product market fit right like <laughs> pour as down. much gasoline right. onto that fire <laughs> as possible is like yeah. the idea and i think benji mm -hmm. and i have also run into that i'm thinking of a particular conference where some people were like well what's your exit strategy and we're like what what just, exit just strategy? run the <laughs> run the business we like, we like, we like the business <laughs> right yeah and and so yeah walk me through like your thinking there did that ever cross yeah. the line early yeah, no, I mean, I think that it's sort of, it's very fascinating to me when I think about this, because I do feel like there is this element of like, the mindset and sort of philosophy you have when you start a business, like gets really ingrained in the culture of the business. And I just think yeah. that's, it's very hard to suss that apart later in terms of like, or, or change that later, because it's like, all I ever wanted for this business was to make enough money to like, kind of have, do the things I want to do, like send the kids to college, go on vacations, have a nice car, buy a house big enough for the family. Like I was not at all. Cause you have to remember too, I'm starting this in 2004 post.com. There is literally no money. Like people say there's no money today for these startups. No, no, no. There was no money. Back then. <laughs> Zero, nothing. Nobody was going to give you one penny. They don't care how much traction you have, how great your you, idea was. No money. You, you know that cause you tried. Yeah, I mean, it was just in the whole air. Like, it was like there I was – I didn't. I never even bothered trying to raise. I mean, I knew lots of people starting up companies, and none of them were raising money. It was less like, yeah. you know, this is not even a thing. Like, yeah. I mean, can you find somebody who raised money? I'm sure you absolutely can, right? But it's like this was not a thing that was being done. Like, there was not right. VCs on every street corner. There was not piles of money being given out. Everybody had just got burned three years ago into oblivion, yeah. and they were like, yeah, we're done with that for now, right? So – but what so, yeah, so I was, that was kind of my whole philosophy it was like, and then, so once we kind of reached that level of like, okay, we can hire a few people. So I don't have to do all the work and we have enough money. Then that was kind of where I stopped. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, I, cool. I, I, like, like, we're good. What was day-to-day -day life like then? Like when you, and I don't know if we're talking about like 2009, 2010, you have like a team that has traction. Was it, were you living this kind of like, <laughs> People use this again as an insult. I said this in the last podcast, but the lifestyle entrepreneur life, like you're like living the, like, where it's like you're working a couple know. hours and then you're hanging out or, or is that? Yeah, I've never had that. I mean, it's a lifestyle <laughs> business in terms of like, I'll take big vacations once in a while or like um, I can work from home, obviously, before like obviously everybody works from home now, but I was working from home, you know, forever before that was a thing really. Yeah. So that was all good stuff. Um, but I never really had the like, oh, I work for two hours a week and the whole thing kind of runs itself. Like, yeah. no, I'm Four definitely hour putting week. in my, <laughs> I mean, those early days I was working an insane, ridiculous amount of hours. Yeah. Um, no, I don't do that now. And then with the team and everything. So now I'm more reasonable hours, but I mean, I'll still be, I'll be up at like, you know, 10 to midnight and I'll do like a coding session still or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like I'm still working a pretty solid amount of hours, not insane or anything not you know eight hours a week but yeah i'm, I'm okay. not working so, so the key thing is just not growing just for the sake of more money at this point yeah i, I kind of hit that level and i was like i'm good and then like um you know i think is, all, is it that, i didn't have a lot of experience with that i didn't have a lot of experience as a even like being a developer or things like that too so it was like it was never so much money where it was like 
I have so much money that I could build out a huge team to double down. So it was like, you know, it was that, it's like an in-between spot. What, was it you not wanting to just manage people and keeping the company small? Oh, or, that's or what? definitely part of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was a manager before um, I started this business, but it's not like my, I, I'm, I actually think I'm decent at it, but at the same time, it's not like, uh, you, you know, I on? like uh, the small team is good. Like I like that yeah. amount of management. Do I want to manage 50 people? Like I do not want to manage 50 people. Do I, I like coding? Like I enjoy coding. So if I'm just like the CEO manager of like 50 people, like now I can't do that. And that's yeah, part yeah. of the reason I got into it too. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, I mean, yeah. I think that when I saw Zendesk come up, I was like, and they like had copied a bunch of our stuff, like straight copied, like screens, words, everything. And I was like, oh, you know, I had a few pangs in there. I was like, oh, maybe we should have gone a different route. Maybe we should have been more aggressive. But, you know, it's sort of interesting, too. Like, obviously, the founder of Zendesk, who I know a little bit, I mean, he's extraordinarily wealthy. So he's he did he did well. But, you know, they've <laughs> literally never been profitable. Like, even to today, they've never been profitable. And we've never not been profitable. We've been yeah, profitable I- since our first month in business and been profitable every month. For that kind of stuff blows years. my mind. And Zendesk has never been profitable. So it's like, uh, you know, I don't know. Like, is obviously, Zendesk public the now? I don't know what's about. Are what's they that? public? Are they public? Oh, yeah, now? they're public. Well, yeah. no, they were public and they just got bought by private equity um, for some billions of dollars type of thing. So I didn't I know mean, that. They yeah. straight copied s- screens in the app. Yeah, they had some like it? straight copied screens from HubSpot early on. You're like, fine some saying this. Stuff. Is this <laughs> I think I've said it before. Uh, it's kind of funny. He sent me uh, one of our one of our kids was born. He sent me like the Zendesk onesie. It's like uh, got the little Buddha. They had this totally like culturally inappropriate logo that they've gotten rid of, which was like this Buddha who's making this funny face and all this stuff. Yeah, uh, oh four, then. that's a lot. Oh, I do, I do remember yeah. that. That was like oh nine, probably. Yeah, yeah oh, it was. Yeah, that stuff that was, was one. Yeah. So I, think I uh, used it at, at that point. Yeah, you know, but I mean, I can't, it's like hard to complain because like, do I see a path where, you know, the other thing is like, I didn't know anything much about running servers. That's the other part. Like, so do I like bring on a co-founder to like run the, ser- like I knew enough to get around, but like if the thing to me is if I had gone that way in the beginning, the question is you could say like, oh, HelpSpot would have been Zendesk, but I think it's just as likely, if not more likely, HelpSpot just wouldn't exist because mm. I would have screwed up the servers. I didn't have money to pay a bunch of server people. And all again, all this stuff we know about how to run a SaaS, a, there's no AWS, there's no anything, right? There's yeah. no like RDS database setups, there's Heroku. no queues, there's no well, nothing, right? So like, you know, it's not just like I can about- wing it on those public clouds for a while until, and overpay for them until I figure out how to run it. No, there was like, <laughs> I would have to buy servers and run them. <laughs> So, like, you know, I think it's very likely that I just screw that up at some point and then there is no business. So, you know, I think overall I can't really complain. That's, you know, we've done everything we've ever wanted to do. Um, so it's, you know, it's really fine. I'm not – I don't feel too bad about that we're not Zendesk. Um, you know, we can't really complain. Well, it also says something about the business, too, that it's profitable versus not profitable, too. So it's right. like if you've been around this long and you're not able to be profitable, like, why? Right. Why? <laughs> yeah. Because you just get stuck in that flywheel, right? Like you have to have more users every month. And so like, that's why Zendesk pays 120 bucks a click on Google and they're not profitable doing that, right? But like, as long as you keep feeding more money in the, on the background with, you know, venture capital and whatever else, like, then you can just buy your way up the ladder there. So, uh, I don't know. I do remember you saying that at the beginning of our engagement. We were like, yeah, and we'll also test the content on Google Ads. And you were like, no, you won't. And we I were just like, laughed. Yeah. Trust us. <laughs> and you were like, dude, like it's cost like a yeah, million dollars. Yeah, you were so the right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not realizing how competitive your category is. It's insane. Yeah. I was like, I know how much we're paying you and not that you guys are the cheapest around, but we would have to pay you a lot more for you guys to be competitive <laughs> at trying to buy these Google Ads and get literally any traction at all. Um, yeah, no, it's cra- It's like one of the most competitive. It's like, it's really insane. Like, yeah. the, the other business philosophy question is then why that, did you contemplate selling it? Because that's then mm-hmm. the other thing that is like the typical pattern that people go to. Oh, I got product market right. fit, growing revenues is good. We can live our life off of it. Other people want to buy sure. a business that's generating that kind of profit. Yeah. Um, and so people want that payday, sell right. the business, get a bunch of cash. Yeah. Did that discussion I mean, ever happen? I've definitely thought about it, of course. Um, 
I don't know, like earlier on, it just felt too early. Like I'm like, oh, I'm too young. Like, I don't know. I'm going to sell this thing. I'm not going to get it. It's not big enough to where like, I would feel like, oh, this amount of money I'm going to get. is like, I never have to work again money. So it's just like, okay, I'm going to buy a decade and then I'm going to have to do something. Like I'm going to have to hope I come up with a product as good as this one in the next decade, or I'm going to have to go work for somebody else or like, so I was like, eh, I, I don't know. I don't feel like that's really worth it. Um, yeah, I mean, once or twice people approach us and, you know, with semi-serious offers, but it just never really, never really worked out. And so, yeah, I mean, we could definitely sell it. I mean, and that's part of, part of the thinking around, even when we hired you guys, this was like, you know, it's like the phase of the business and I don't, you know, plan on selling it anytime soon, but at the same time where I've been okay with like, you know, just going up 5% every year for the last decade, like, it's like, okay, maybe... I have a little more time, a little more energy. Kids are bigger. Team's in a good spot. Like, let's try to kick it up. Let's actually pay for some marketing. Let's see if we can just actually try to create a little bit of growth. Um, and then, yeah, in a, 10 years from now, if we can build that up a little bit, like, yeah, then maybe we could sell it enough for, you know, I don't have to work, you know, after that and type of thing. So yeah, that's kind of back in my mind. But, yeah, no, I, I don't know. I never really tried to sell it. Uh, or uh, anything like that. Obviously, I've thought about it here and there, but yeah. So then, yeah, getting into the marketing, which is what obviously we love to talk about. Right. Um, <laughs> before we get into us and 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 your decision to hire us, and even I don't think I've ever asked you what how you found out about us. Uh, until that point, it was still just <clears throat> being an incumbent, word of mouth, right? I assume you by that point have lost. I mean, we're fast forwarding to like. I don't know when you, when we started working together, but like 20, 20 months ago, maybe something yeah, like that. 20, 22. But like at some point you lost your 2005 help desk software. <laughs> Monopoly. Number, yeah, right. number one, like listing as SEO sure. change. Was there any marketing done? I mean, not really. So like we've done a few times, um, you know, we still had some, you know, a few spots with SEO is okay. Not amazing. Definitely. We have a reasonable size customer base for our size company and help the software is the kind of thing where people do bring it with them. So, you know, you, cause you do are exposing it to all these people who are like, you have the managers who are, or the VPs or whatever who buy, but then you have all the agents and, you know, an agent will go somewhere else and they'll be like, Hey, at my last job, I used, you know, help spot, you know, we should mm -hmm. use that here. And so we'll get, get, um, you know, yeah, so it's like brand and word of mouth is key. Yeah, it's well, word of mouth, pretty heavy. Um, and then I also think a key thing is that you serve a pretty specific customer base and use and the use cases are a lot right. smaller than what most people would consider just help desk software. Like you you're not you don't have chat bots, you don't have like social right. media app tie and stuff like that. Uh, maybe yeah, maybe speak to that a little bit because I think yeah, that helps. So it's still um yeah, we have a pr pretty focused uh, on just email and, and a help desk portal. Like we don't get into social media or, or voice or things like that. Um, and part of that is like, there are some elements where like not being a pure SaaS, even the way we do it now, isn't quite the same as a pure SaaS, which makes some of those things just harder, uh, to do, but also we do have our little niche here, which is that like, we're really focused on email. And we still have on-premise. So if you want to run on-premise, like none of the SaaS apps have on-premise. So this is a, you know, it's sort of interesting because it's like everything went SaaS. And so then everybody was like, it must be SaaS, it must be SaaS, it must be SaaS. And then it's kind of like, I was like, oh, you know, that was like a rough period of like, oh man, like is everything going to go SaaS? And that's where we like, we built our own SaaS because like, well, we can't be totally left behind on the SaaS train. So we did that. But now it's kind of come back where like there, you know, you have all this other stuff going on with security and things. And so people are like, well, if we really need to have super tight control of our security, like we kind of have to sometimes run it in house for certain types of businesses, like especially a lot like financial sector, healthcare. Um, those are the kind of industries that still have IT shops in house that have a lot of things that they just don't trust public clouds with, whether it's like health information or things like that. And so they want, you know, on premise. Um, and that's something like Zendesk can't give them or fresh desk can't give them and things like that. So, so we've had this little resurgence in that end of the world where we have that niche, um, going. 
so yeah so and and we do and uh, they the world's kind of expanded into other areas where like hr departments use help desk software and uh maintenance departments use help desk software and so there's the it's gotten even broader from like it started as just like every company needs help desk software in their like customer service but now it's like every company needs help desk software in their customer service and in their hr and you know if you're a college in your admissions department and in your maintenance department because like everybody just has all this email to deal with so um and yeah and those they, those are also nice for us because like the maintenance department doesn't care about social media integration, right? Like they're just the maintenance department and they get emails. And so uh, that worked for us in that regard. Nice. So then uh, moving to SEO and all, the decision to hire us, where you heard about us, I'm sure I asked you this in our first sales call, but I don't remember. Yeah. Um, um, you, 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 had, you said you already knew a little bit about SEO. And so I'm curious first, just like why look for external help? Maybe you're just too busy at that time or, or did you try yeah, to do I it? Think, um, well, and just to wrap up the other part is like, we did hi have hired ostensibly consultants that are ostensibly like you guys, but mm -hmm. they weren't. Um, and they're just writing articles because it's like we have articles and we put them up and they're, you know, often about help desk agents or about how to handle a help desk scenario. And none of those ever worked, which is what, um, when I, so then when I found you guys, which I want to say it was probably from Twitter, but to be honest with you, I don't remember exactly. I feel like maybe somebody retweeted something Benji posted is what I'm thinking, but, uh, David, David wasn't active on social media back then. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. He's only become active recently. <laughs> right. I was, so, I was maintaining the mainframes. So right. I didn't, <laughs> they had you in the basement enough time. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, and uh, your guys' approach really stood out to me. That was the main thing. It was like, oh, like, yes, be focused on conversion. That's a good idea. Like, I, I, that makes sense. Instead of just, like, ranking for random stuff, let's rank for things that people actually are, you know, have purchasing intent on. Um, and then your style of, you know, going about that was interesting. And one that I think I hadn't seen as much of anyway. Um by define our style. How, how do you, how do you word it? So to me, your style is that you you know the article. I mean, the, the articles are basically like what I would think of as like more of like a page on the marketing site and not really a blog post, right? So yeah. it's like because it's very focused on like our features and you're selling our features. And yes, you have like everything else to flesh it out into like a blog post, but it's really kind of like you're landing on our website and you're learning about email management software and how HelpSpot does that. Um, and yeah. then, you know, there's the other parts in there to flesh it out. But, you know, you're making the case for HelpSpot explicitly. Whereas, like, obviously, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen this a million times. Like, most of the content writing you see for SEO is like, yeah, like, HelpSpot is, like, linked when we talk about HelpSpot in the one sentence. But, like, it's, yeah. not, it's not like a push towards, like, no, yeah. you're on the website for HelpSpot and HelpSpot does the thing you're looking for and here's how it does it. Uh, and wouldn't that be great for you? And, like, actually selling. So, yeah, uh, to me, that was, you know, the difference. Okay. So that's the core, our core, you know, positioning and differentiation right. that your thing stood out is like everyone else yeah. is writing what we, what you just described, we call top of the funnel. Right. So they, they can't do a help spot sales pitch because they're trying to write something on, I don't know, like how to treat customers well or something <laughs> like, right. So right. Right. That, exactly. Yeah. Right? Whereas like, we're writing to rank for, uh, help desk type software. So uh, when I'm, you say that the. Go ahead, oh, Benji. I'm just curious, what made you want to do it again? So if you already tried it before and you said you hired people and it didn't work, mm -hmm. then then why give it another shot? Because I feel like a lot of people try one channel, yeah, kind of give up on it, just thinking it's not going to work. So yeah. were, did you have like any small wins or something that gave you confidence that it could work if you found the right strategy? Yeah. So, I mean, I think... I mean, I'm still a big SEO. I mean, I don't think there's ever been anything invented that's as powerful as someone at that Google search box saying what they want. Like, there's yeah. just yeah. nothing <laughs> better than that. Like, that's yeah. the ultimate sales tool. So then it's just a matter of like, okay, how, and then we and we still do get some business from FE, SEO even before I hired you guys. It's like, yes, well, we weren't ranked as high, but even though we might be 23rd, like people are still finding us there because they're going through. And obviously Google's made it much harder with like 23rd is now like, the 4,000th link after all the boxes <laughs> and inserts and maps yeah. and everything else that's there now. But, um, which I think is also even a factor, like even when we were higher ranked, like that high, when back in the day, like if you were number three, like you were literally like the fifth, the fifth link on the page. Like now number three, you're still like below the fold and like, you know, yeah. but 
whatever. So, um, yeah, so, like, I still believed in SEO, and that was the main part. And then it was just, like, how do we, you know, I even, like I said, I know a fair amount about SEO, and so I know what I wanted, but, A, I'd never mm. really seen anybody do it, and, B, um, I know I can't do it. Like, I'm not a good writer. I don't have the patience to write it, and I'm busy doing everything else because – we have, you know, hundreds of customers and all everything going on every day. So I'm just not going to sit down and write like a 1500 word article. It's just never going to happen. So, um, so it's kind of like those things. So that's where, when I saw you guys, I was like, oh yes, th this is what I'm looking for. So it wasn't even like, I was, I was starting to think about doing more with it. And then it's like, I saw, I found you guys and I was like, oh yeah, that's what I mm. want. Like, yeah. um, and then w once we started working together, my memory of this is that you had incredible patience. So mm. I'm going to talk about the results for a little bit, sure. but they took time. And Benji, you have, uh, as I always say, a much better memory than mine, which is the size of a small mouse. Um, now we're, we have some pretty cool rankings. I don't know, Ian, if you're cool with me reading off some of the sure. words that we're ranking high for. So like yeah. we have you... This is as of four days ago, update from, um, anyway, the self-hosted help desk, number one spot, GDPR help desk, number one spot. Oh, that but we also have like, like, even if we're not at help desk software anymore, like 2005, right. we still have top three spots or like first page for help desk software for Linux, number two. Mm. And then there was another one, help desk software for small business, number four down two uh, spots from number two, right. uh, you know, like <laughs> email, happens. email help desk software, top five. And so like, those are pretty cool, but was it the blog on a subdomain thing? It was, wasn't it? That it took months. Oh, I and forgot I about that. You had yeah. a ton of patience where you were like, yeah, I'm not really worried about it. Right. Like, <laughs> this will, this will turn, yeah, this will I, I will off. tell you for me, I was, I feel like I was always conscious about your account just being like oh why is why are things not working right. because <laughs> i i think what you said earlier about how competitive your category is i just didn't even really think about it when yeah. when going into the space and and thinking about how much money is getting thrown at seo how much m money is getting thrown at paid uh going after all these keywords yeah and i did think that we had some advantage because again we're going after some of these more specific keywords that maybe some of the other players aren't focused on as much. Right. But even even then, it was still really, really challenging. It was definitely an uphill battle. But, but uh, I'm curious if you could walk through your mindset of like, what were you looking for? And what Benji says is funny. So we at that time, we were big enough to where both of us stopped going to every client call. We would split. So mm -hmm. we, we and one of our strategy, you know, whoever, whatever strategy is working on it would be on the call. So I was with you. So Benji would be like, when we talked, he'd be like, Ian's going to quit like tomorrow. Like, what is, what is happening? With and I was like, no, trust me. He's like super happy on the You're call. Like he's like, off the like, call in like five minutes. And he's I know, like, yeah, yeah cool. I, like, I, I know. And I couldn't ever believe it. I, I was like, <laughs> oh, things are just not moving. What is yeah. going on here? Yeah, the the, uh, the speed of the calls was also hilarious. Right. I'm like, <laughs> I would be, I think I had this call that butted up to it. And I would always come on like, and I'd be like, I'm sorry, Meg, I'm like super late. I'm like, two thousand. it was like 1108 or something like my right. time Pacific. And she's like, we're already off. I was like, it says waiting for host. And right. like, we're already off the call. I'm like, what we're did done. you even talk about? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so what know. were you looking for that you were okay and satisfied with it because we try yeah. to teach our clients a lot about this patience with seo to get right. the kind of results that i just read off like people want that for their niche they want that right. for that SaaS company but it takes time yeah. and you had enough patience to where even we were uncomfortable right so, so what were you looking for and, and okay with yeah i think uh, it's a few different things there so one is uh just as a bootstrap founder like i am so used to everything taking an incredibly insane long time like mm -hmm. everything we do i hope it's going to be fast but it always is like way way longer than i want it to be i'm very comfortable with that now i know it's going to take a long time whatever we do so i'm already in that mindset with literally everything i'm like okay this is going to take a year because like you know, you could tell me it's going to take a month, but I know it's going to take a year because like to actually do it, it's just going to take a long time. And, you know, we're a small team, which this doesn't impact you guys obviously directly, but still we're a small team and we're not like, 
So even with everything we do, I'm not like, uh, you know, we don't have, it's not just that I don't work 80 hours. Nobody works 80 hours and people have lots of time off and all this stuff. So, you know, it just takes a long time. Sometimes people work three days in a week. So obviously things are going to take longer that way and stuff. So, so just my mindset is that, um, and then I have worked a lot with SEO over the years. Like I'm not like the ultimate guru, but on the technical side, I'm pretty good. And then just in general, I know the generalities of the industry and like, and then I know help desk software. So it's just yeah. like, I just know that there's like literally hundreds of millions, if not like billions of dollars being poured in here. And a large chunk of that is like going towards SEO efforts. And like, even though maybe they're not using the strategies you guys are using entirely and that, so we have some advantages there it's just going to take a long time uh, because you're just not going to show up one day. You know, everybody's tried everything. So you're not going to show up one day with some magic bullet that like nobody in the help desk software has ever done. Like that's just not going to happen. So it's going to be the like, yeah, get the good content and then do all the other stuff you have to do around that to make it all work, which is why like, you know, just leveraging little advantages. I think one of the things we did part of the slowness at that beginning was me too, because we, we did our whole website to be SEO optimized because I wanted this to be an advantage we could have also, which is that like, if you go to Zendesk and you put it in what like web.dev there, the like lighthouse Google thing to check its SEO performance, it's like twenties everywhere because like there's literally hundreds of marketing JavaScript inserts and all kinds of stuff that seven committees have decided that must be on the homepage and everything else. <laughs> and so like, okay. So I was like, I want, I want to be like over 90 and everything and a hundred if we can. So, you know, at now the help spot website is like, you know, 97 or whatever and everything in all four categories. And we made all these sacrifices to do that, but it's like, well, whatever, like this is something where we can be better in a way they could literally never be better. Like they will never be able to get that Zendesk website to 97 optimized because they're just inserting too much shit in it to ever, yeah. you know, it's got 20 megabytes of junk that loads in and whatever else. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, I knew that would take time for Google to recognize that and blah, 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 blah. So yeah, you know, so I guess it was just like expecting it to take a long time to begin with. And then, uh, you know, knowing that some of it's on my end and, uh, you know, and then just writing the content is going to take months for it to build up and, and, and then, index. um, the, the results, I remember at one point you said something like, like we were reporting on the number of leads or demo requests we had there. And it was still early on. It was like a single digit number, like say mm -hmm. five or something. And you said something like, no, like you, you guys need to check how you're doing the attribution because I think you're undercounting your own leads because I know I'm getting more demos. Right. They have to be coming from this. Yeah. What, what was behind that? Like, did you, you, you just felt an uptick on the sales side? Yeah, the thing that really that... led me to it was that um, we had done some, you know, one of our competitors had decided to not offer on-premise anymore. So I brought that to you guys and said, hey, let's do some articles about them and on-premise because they're abandoning all these customers and yeah. all those customers are going to be looking for an alternative. Uh, and so then we were getting very specific, like, responses when we talked to people about that, that they're you know, well, it's Spiceworks is the name of the company. And they'd be, so we'd be talking to them and they'd be like, Hey, like Spiceworks ditched us, you know, we're looking for an alternative. So yeah. the only Spiceworks content on our website is what you guys wrote. So like this very like tied together here. And, Which is ranking number three right now. For right. Spiceworks. There we go. So like, um, <laughs> so yeah, so I was like, well, I know that like I'm talking to, I mean, I'm talking to like three or four people a month about just Spiceworks. So like there has to be more going on. And you know, this is also a weird thing about our industry where I know, I think the whole time you guys have probably been getting undercounted, even after we tweaked some things, like what we tweaked there was to count the contact form submissions. Um, so yep. those counted for you also. And because in B2B, especially in our, I don't know about all B2B, but definitely in help desk software, like there's, it's just not, they come in on the article and they sign up for the trial. Like that's just never how it goes. It's very rare that happens. So you know, it's like, okay, I come in, I wander around, I send the link to my boss, the boss goes and looks, like they set up a demo, like it's a 28 steps yeah. before they've even on a trial. So like, how do you do attribution through all that? It's like basically impossible. So, you know, I always expected that to be somewhat on a curve there too, where like, you're just not gonna be able to attribute a lot of these things because it's just too hard. Yeah, I'm actually looking at 
we're, we're recording this on February 17th and I'm looking at February from the first to the 13th. And I'm, I'm looking at the conversions we got from our blog posts for you guys. And there is one, two, three, four, five different blog posts that if you look at what you're talking about, same session conversions, mm. it would show zero. Right. Luckily, <laughs> in Google Model Comparison Tool, as we've written about, we look at, at like multi-touch first interaction. So mm -hmm. if they had closed the browser, come back later, within three months, it's fine. Right. But what you're talking about is also something we've written about a long time ago, many years ago, but it's buried in one of our posts. And most people probably haven't seen it or heard us talk about it. But it's worth a mention, which is that even the multi-touch attribution, what we call first click, it it's really, there should be an asterisk that says, first click, same browser right. has never cleared <laughs> cookies. Like that's what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. So Does if it, it, yeah. Well, I just gonna say, there's all kinds of other things too. Like, I mean, you have like, in, especially in our space where it's sometimes more technical people, you have people with ad blockers. Sometimes they block I yeah. use the Brave browser. cookies. Like, you know, yeah, a lot of Brave browser use. So there's a million things in there. That's why, to me, I was always looking more for, you know, I was willing to take the time to see how it went over time because one of the advantages is we aren't doing anything else. So we're doing you guys, and that's it. <laughs> so... Like so I can see just overall see, demo growth. Yeah, you're like, well, what like, could it be? Exactly. Like it's you guys <laughs> if it's going up. And so like 2022 you know, was up and uh, 2023 started up and the end of 2021 was up. So like, it's like, okay, well, like, and I, like, I just told you, like, it's been level for like 10 years essentially, or like yeah. just the slightest uptick every year. So like, I figure that's yeah. you guys, right? Like even yeah. without all the analytics or whatever else, it's like, Hey, like, I know I'm not on podcasts every day or I'm not, uh, you right. know, there wasn't, we didn't get mentioned some on TechCrunch or something like, it's like, yeah, it's just every month there's a few more, you know, sales and that's great. So, yeah. That we, we've said the same thing for us. It's like, yeah, it's nice when there's one channel marketing. Yeah. It's, it's like, we don't worry about attribution. We're like, we got right. a bunch of leads. The content must be working. How do you know? <laughs> because that's the only thing we do. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. The, the B2B, the big thing on B2B is like the different computers and coworkers. You just can't track yeah. them. Right. Like if, 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 you know, rank and file employee a reads it, tells their boss and then boss signs up for a demo, you're not getting credit for it. <laughs> yeah. Or they, like, or they do show a homepage direct. <laughs> right. Or they email in and we set up a demo with them and then we build the trial for them or whatever. There's like 10 other ways that they could get set up with a trial. That would just be, you would never be able to attribute it back to like a specific post. Um, and you know, oftentimes again, like even if we ask them, it's like the person I'm talking to is not the person who found it or the, you know, cause there's yeah. very, very often it's like, we're in there with five other people. So, you know, five other companies. So what happens is, you know, a flunky gets sent off, find the best five help desk software that look like they might work for us. They come back with the five, then the committee looks at them. Then they set up demo. Like, so you're this way <laughs> yeah. disconnected from that person who found it to begin with and stuff. So yeah. Yeah very hard yeah, to I think the, the other benefit of our bottom of the funnel strategy is because of these attribution issues you can just look at the keywords and use common sense like if we're right. like you know if you're thinking is this investment and this project worth it and we're like well we're ranking number one for self-hosted help desk gdpr help desk number okay. two for help desk for linux you're just like well, what the hell do you think people are Googling that are going to do? Right. They're looking right. for help desk software. Like that's yeah. that's going to do it versus if you do content marketing at the top of the funnel, that's a big question. Well, if we wrote this piece on best ways to like keep your customers happy, you're like, I don't know. Right. Like did that sell help desk demos? Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, who knows? It, do it doesn't. I assure you it does not. Um, yeah, I, I was just going to transition and say what – what is what is what is in the line for help to help spot what's next what are you guys looking to do 2023 and beyond kind of our uh, well i mean we have a couple of things going on i don't know if you just mean marketing or the whole thing but like oh, the, the whole thing Any, the anything whole thing. you're comfortable revealing yeah yeah like i already talked about i mean we're kind of going through a technological rebuild here as like to make the platform um just to make it easier to work on. Cause there is like, you know, old code in there that now is quite old and things like that. And even though it's reliable and tested and everything else like that, it's still like, we want to be able to do more stuff faster. So probably not social media, but things like open AI integrations going to come up heavy mm -hmm. here and things like, 
uh, you know, whether it's SMS or different areas where we could do more and it could be easier to integrate with other things, especially also taking all the stuff we've learned and, uh, you know, decisions we've made in the past that now that we know more, we would do differently. So changing features to be more what I think is going to be a lot, a lot better for customers, but Marketing oh, the wise, AI, I mean, thing, mm-hmm. AI really makes sense for you guys. I didn't think oh, about yeah. that because the Super responses are so repetitive yeah. that you could train an AI to know what to respond to really. And it could auto complete for you. That's actually really, yeah, so, I mean, the main things are really like, I mean, someday I don't think it's quite to the point where it's going to be able to fully reply like with the full accuracy. Cause the thing is like, the thing is like, if you reply really well to 90%, but the other 10% are a dumpster fire that's hor- like that's terrible like you can't be yeah. having 10 percent of your customer service be like a totally yeah. wrong answer right so like there is like a so i think we're a little ways from that although obviously that's people are going to be pushing for that and want that definitely. for sure um but but the step back from that is still quite interesting which is things like the agent maybe just writes one sentence with the solution just roughly and let ai write the other 40 words of flowery language about hello customer you know, mm-hmm. this is what we found. This is how you can fix it. Please let us know mm-hmm. if you don't, you know, like all that kind of stuff or generate a knowledge base article from a request automatically that, you know, somebody, a human is still going to probably quick review it, but you didn't have to like literally write all that stuff um, or just cleaning up language in different areas and some maybe auto routing like, oh, I know this type of, this person's asking a question that's for this department. Uh, oh, this one's for that yeah. department. And so we can have oh, like routing. routing and stuff like that. So that I think there's going to be help desk is going to be one where like, there's a lot of use cases pretty quickly. Like some of the intercom already released AI features. I'm sure everybody else is working on them. You know, we won't be right there at the release with everybody else. Cause we're little, but we will get there eventually. I am patient <laughs> and we will get there eventually. But um, yeah, but AI and help desk is going to be pretty huge. I think. Yeah. So stuff like that for sure. Um, well, this has been this has been fascinating, and and we appreciate you taking the time. I think this is really yeah. educational for anyone, especially people bootstrapping um, a company, and then hopefully some people like you and like us who are not thinking the moment we have product market fit, how do I rocket ship this as big as possible and sort of you know grow and keep a business that's that's profitable or. Yeah, I think with how the market's kind of, you know, things are a little bit weird right now. um, It's like a time where like people can just think a little more like that. It's like, hey, if you made a million dollars a year, would you be better than you are at your current job? Like, probably for most people, right? So like, maybe you don't have to be worth a hundred million dollars. Like maybe you can make 800,000 or 1.2 and like, that's (laughs) going to change your life. And you, you can just dial in a lot of things differently if you're not always thinking about like, I must raise money. I must then, which obviously said, if you want to raise money, you have to become big. Like that's the whole thing. Like you can't right. not become big because the whole economic model is around you becoming big or failing. Like that's the idea. So, um, yeah. So I think that people should think about that a little bit more. It's kind of went out of fashion with so much easy money out there, but I think, uh, I think it's coming back, coming back a little bit in certain areas. Yeah. I mean, it's never been easier to build software in some ways, some ways it's hard, but, still the, the tools are out there it's cheap to host it and all that stuff so you don't need a lot of money to start um yeah but i really love working with you guys i appreciate it having me on here um yeah yeah i definitely recommend you guys to anyone out there happy to be a recommender uh reference as needed <laughs> sounds good now you, you promised that and now we'll yeah. send you emails <laughs> i know <laughs> no problem at all all right thanks to you thanks